Now let's talk about transactions. This is a huge topic and beyond the scope of this course. But let's look at the essentials. So what happens when a method is transactional? Now the method executes inside of a transaction. If anything goes wrong in the middle of the method execution, the transaction will be rolled back. Otherwise, it will be committed. So for example, let's say there were 100 comments in the database and while this method is being executed, 30 of them were successfully streamed. But then something happens in the middle of it and it could not read from the database anymore. Since this method runs within a transaction, the whole method will fail instead of returning 30 comments. And that prevents us from getting an incomplete list of comments. Spring provides comprehensive transaction support. And here's a very simplified overview of how it works. Spring Framework's transaction support is enabled via AOP proxies. So the caller of the method invokes the proxy, not the target. And at this point, a transaction is created. Then the target method is invoked. And on the way back, either the transaction is committed or rolled back. How do we enable Spring's transaction management? Typically, it is enabled using at enable transaction management annotation, or it could be done via XML as well. But this is a Spring Boot application, so most of the configuration is done for me. Because I have Spring data libraries in the class path, transaction management is enabled by the framework, so I don't have to do anything to enable transaction management. In order to apply transaction management, all you have to do is add the add transactional annotation. Now let's look at the annotation. The add transactional annotation is metadata that specifies an interface class or method must have transactional semantics. For example, start a brand new read-only transaction when this method is invoked, suspending any existing transaction. There are quite a few settings that can be applied to this annotation. This table from the documentation lists all of them. First, there is value, which specifies the transaction manager to be used. Then there is propagation. These are the transaction propagation behaviors defined by the propagation ENA. Let's look at a couple of them. First, the default one, which is required. Supports a current transaction, creates a new one if none exists. If there is a transaction already started, then this method will execute within that. Otherwise, a new one will be created. Requires new. Creates a new transaction and suspend the current transaction if one exists. The next attribute I want to look at is read-only, which is a boolean. What happens when the read-only attribute is set to true? The default is false by the way. Spring doesn't handle persistence, so it cannot define exactly what read-only should do. So this is just a hint to the provider, which in this case is Hibernate. According to the documentation, if using Hibernate as the JPA provider, when read-only flag is set to true, flash mode on the Hibernate session will be set to never, preventing any changes to data. Following is an excerpt from the Spring Data documentation which states this. It's definitely reasonable to use transactions for read-only queries and we can mark them as such by setting the read-only flag. This will not, however, act as check that you do not trigger a manipulating query. Although some databases reject insert and update statements inside a read-only transaction, the read-only flag instead is propagated as hint to the underlying JDBC driver for performance optimizations. Furthermore, Spring will perform some optimizations on the underlying JPA provider. Example, when used with Hibernate, the flash mode is set to never when you configure a transaction as read-only, which causes Hibernate to skip dirty checks, a noticeable improvement on large objectories. Next is timeout, in which you can give the number of seconds before timeout. And then there is rollback for, which is an array of classes extending from throwable 
These are the exceptions that must cause a rollback. The rest of the attributes are rollback for class name, no rollback for, no rollback for class name, for which you can take a look if you want to use them. Spring Transaction Management also supports the at transactional annotation from Java as a drop-in replacement for the at transactional annotation provided by Spring. But it lacks some of the settings available in the one from Spring such as read-only and timeout, which are quite useful. So I would use the Spring's transactional annotation instead of the one from Java. So what happens under the hood when the at transactional annotation is added? When at transactional is present, Spring creates a proxy which will stand between the caller and the target so that external invocations will always call the method on proxy and then the proxy will invoke the actual method. But before the method invocation, it will create a transaction. Once the method execution finishes on the target, the transaction will be committed or rolled back. So that's that. Now the transactional annotation can be placed on interfaces, classes, or both class and interface methods. But Spring recommends that you only annotate concrete classes and methods of concrete classes with the at transactional annotation as opposed to annotating interfaces. You certainly can place the at transactional annotation on an interface or an interface method, but this works only as you would expect it to if you are using interface-based proxies. The fact that Java annotations are not inherited from interfaces means that if you are using class-based proxies, that is proxy target class set to true or the weaving based aspect mode set to aspect J, then the transaction settings are not recognized by the proxying and weaving infrastructure and the object will not be wrapped in a transactional proxy, which would be decidedly bad. What does that mean? This is about the transaction configuration in Spring. When using XML-based configuration, there will be a line like the following in the config file, which would enable annotation-driven transaction management. These are the settings or the attributes which can be set on this tag. There is transaction manager, the mode, the proxy target class, and the order. Since we are using Java-based configuration, let's look at the annotation which would be used to provide the same configuration as above. So it is the at enable transaction management annotation. And it has these three optional elements, mode, order, and proxy target class. Regardless of the mode of configuration, that is either XML or Java-based configuration, so long as we have not specifically set these attributes, the default values apply. So let's look at each one. The proxy target class could be either true or false. The default value is false, in which case JDK interface-based proxies are created. If this attribute is set to true, then CGLib proxies will be used which are class-based, and therefore any at transactional annotations on interfaces will be ignored. Now the mode. There are two values that can be applied to the mode attribute, proxy and aspect J. The default value of mode attribute is proxy, which processes annotated beans to be proxied using Spring's AOP framework which would proxy interfaces annotated with at transactional. But when the mode is set to aspect J, the interfaces annotated with at transactional will be ignored because the aspect that interprets at transactional annotations is the annotation transaction aspect. When using this aspect, you must annotate the implementation class and or methods within that class, not the interface if any. That the class implements. Aspect J follows Java's rule that annotations on interfaces are not inherited. So, as mentioned earlier, because this is a Spring Boot application, transaction management is enabled by the framework without me having to add the at enable transaction management annotation. So, that means I'm using the default settings for proxy target class and mode. 
So as of now, I have no restrictions as to where to place the transactional annotation. But it is safer to follow the recommendation in case those need to be changed. There are a couple of things to keep in mind when using proxy mode, which is the default setting. First, only external method calls will be transactional. Even though a method is marked with a transactional annotation, if it is called within another method of the same object, it will not have transactional behavior. The second one is that you should apply the add transactional annotation only to methods with public visibility. If you annotate protected private or package visible methods with the add transactional annotation, no error is raised, but the annotated method does not exhibit the configured transactional settings. So if you want transactional behavior in either self-invocations or non-public methods, consider the use of aspect J mode instead of proxy. To summarize, Spring recommends to only annotate concrete classes and methods of concrete classes with a transactional. When using default configuration settings, a method would be transactional only if it is called externally and if it is of public visibility. I highly recommend reading the documentation for Spring Transaction Management as we cannot cover everything here.